It is my pleasure to be here today with Sarah Grisson from Parkland College in Champaign, Illinois. So yeah, we're, we're the sister school to the University of Illinois uh, at Urbana-Champaign. So um, we're the two-year community college that feeds most of our transfer students into the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. So we work together to help our students. Right on. And it's a community college, right? Yep. Yes, yes, yes. Um, we are open access, so we have students from our district and outside our district. Um, we take everybody, um, and we have a lot of career students who are doing nursing, agriculture, crim- criminal justice, contr- construction, all that kind of stuff. But we have a lot of transfer students as well. You know, I do remember watching you give a talk, and I don't know when this was, and just I saw you kind of well with pride about the kind of institution that you're a part of. Uh, Do you just want to, before we start to talk about some other things, what is it like to teach at a community college and why do you like it so much? You know, this is what a great question to start with. Thank you, Garth. Um, I started my career teaching at Carnegie Mellon University. I was a senior. I was still doing my undergraduate degree and they needed those of us who did well in introductory psychology to help with the discussion section. So that was the first time I ever taught. And from there, I taught high school for many years. Um, And after I taught high school, I taught at University of Illinois, University of uh, Wales, Bangor. And then I uh, came back here to the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. And I taught there for several years before Parkland. So I have had a really wide range of experiences in teaching. Um, And I I loved my time at University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. I will sing their praises to the end of the world. I was the director of intra-psych there. Um, But I was also teaching classes of two, 300 students at the same time as being the director. And what I found was that I didn't get to know my students as well as I would like. You need to know your students to understand how to help them achieve their goals. You know, you know, this working at at the school you work at, a community college, there's a lot of things that get in the way. They have these twisty life paths. So the more we can know them and get in their minds, um, the better we can support them. So coming to Parkland, um, I was genuinely honored to get the opportunity to come here and teach small classes, very hands on with students. And I always joke that, you know, that's fine. You can miss your homework, but I know you work at Dairy Queen on Friday. So I'll see you there. (laughs) I love it. I love it. Well, so tell me, I know that you're a textbook author. Uh, Your book is Psychology in Your Life. It's an introductory psychology book. And I uh, so I have two. I have a question and a follow up question. When did you first write the first edition of that book? Mm -hmm. Great question. I was actually still at the University of Illinois. So um, this is one of these very genuine experiences. Uh, You know how we wear lots of hats when we're in higher ed. So I had a hat where I was teaching these large sections, two or three a term. I was also the director, which meant I had to organize all of the teaching for all the sections. And most of those are taught by graduate students. So I was also in charge of the graduate teaching training for psychology at UIUC. And HLC was coming for their 10-year visit. And so they said, oh, and by the way, develop an assessment plan and sort that out, please, for intro psych. So I I had all these hats on. um, And at one point, it just occurred to me, all these pieces really work together. Being a teacher who uses evidence-based approaches to support student learning goes along with helping teachers to understand what those evidence-based approaches are that will really work. And that goes along with developing assessment tools. So those three things are interconnecting activities. And I was spending 80 hours of my life trying to design all of this because this was back, oh gosh, 2007, 2008 is when I was doing that work. And I thought a publisher should really take this multi-pronged, completely integrative approach. And none of them were. Um, And so publishers uh, came and started talking to me. And when uh, Sherry Snavely at WW Norton came and talked to me, she said, "Um, I don't want to hear what you have to say. I want to see you teach a class. So she sat in on one of my classes and then we had uh, lunch and I told her about this idea that publishers really needed to take this holistic approach to supporting 
student learning with their textbooks and their learning tools, but also supporting teachers in helping get the best information about what's going to help them teach and also embedding assessment so that they can have direct information about whether these tools are working or not. And that was the start of it. So um, we started the first edition, gosh, a couple years thereafter, 2011, 2012 is when we started. It didn't come out till several years after that. But yeah, that's how it all got started. Wow. Okay. So, okay. I have my follow-up question is how has the book, because you are in addition, help me out right now. Four. You're in addition four. Yes. Fourth edition. Um, yes. So help me understand how did being in a smaller class change that way that you yeah. approached like following editions of your book? Um, by the way, I've got a million questions. So, uh, you know, <laughs> just tell me if I'm keeping you too long, but I really am interested. No, no, no. I, I th- This is great because um, you, you've sort of intuitively understood that the arc of this is really important, right? Having opportunities to teach big classes, small classes, be an administrator, t- train teachers, do assessment, all of this comes together. So um, the way that I function now is that my classroom is really a learning lab. Um, so it whether you call it SOTL, whether you call it action research, my classroom, because I only teach 25 students at a time in a class, I function it as a space where I can develop these ideas. Um, And just as an example, you know, in, in, in the years after transitioning from UIUC over here to Parkland, I had the opportunity to teach first year experience, which is sometimes called student success in other places. And as I was teaching it, this focus on giving first term, often underprepared first generation students, the skills they need to succeed in college and beyond, that just blew my mind, right? This idea of focusing on, yes, academic skills, but personal skills, career development. Um, As I was teaching that, and I taught that for several years, all of these topics align with constructs we teach naturally in intro psych. So I, the idea came to me, why are we not infusing these success skills that are taught all over the country? The research is really clear that FYE and student success can be really important in helping students achieve you know, better persistence, retention, better grades, better outcomes. Why aren't we doing this more in other introductory books? Like interest, like it's a natural fit. We don't have to add content. It's just making explicit this idea that if you want to engage active learning to make sure somebody's reading a textbook or taking notes, really what you're talking about is some of the concepts like elaborative rehearsal or using cues or things like that. If we just align it with material in those areas, then we can get this done in intrapsych as well. So I reorganized my intrapsych class, which, as you know, is no easy feat, right? It's a huge ship. So turning it on a dime is hard. So piece by piece, I started doing research. What are the skills? If if we're going to focus on pulling these into intersight, what are the skills? So spending time, like you said, with a little time off, thanks to my college doing that research, I started pulling in these skills into intersight and term after term, I added more and more skills and beta tested them and found out what were students' perceptions of these skills, like developing a growth mindset, uh, cultivating better attention, using elaborative rehearsal and cues. What were their attitudes about it? How did it affect their performance in the class? Where are some of the outcomes? And after about three years, I went back to the publisher and I said, this is, this is big. My students are coming back and saying, at the end of my class, their last reflection, I'm having a significant portion saying that the most important thing they learned was about these skills for success. And I could only do that because I was at Parkland. Yeah. Right. So that gave me the space to do it. So that that's how important it is to use these small classrooms as these learning spaces to get these as a beta test for these ideas that I can then bring back to the book. Yeah, it's one of the things that strikes me about your work is that uh, you do from what I've just just chatting on the side or listening to you uh, talk, you really do take your cues from your students. And um, that's informed the way that you write this book. Um, So. Would would you say that the biggest jump in the way that you approach your book is this fourth edition? Did you do some significantly different things? Because I'm guessing like as you as you learn more and more, things just have to continue to shift until I don't I don't know. I have the sense that you 
kind of overhauled a couple things in this edition. Is that is that right? Yeah, we did. We wanted to be responsive um, to what we hear from teacher. Yes, my my own experience is obviously, but you know we can't we can't assume that it's one size fits all, right? Different teachers at different schools with different students, and what you look for is the patterns. I mean, the content of intrapsych is often very stable. We have to look for what bubbles up that's interesting or new, you know, whether it's gut brain connections or use of psychotropics and mental health. We have to look for what's new and what's been replicated um, to, to put it in terms of content. But we have to look to people who are in the field teaching to see patterns about what is emerging as important to them. And if we aren't responsive to the needs of teachers, then we're obsolete. Because really, although a textbook is there to ensure that students learn, it's teachers who are looking at and seeing, is this is this the right approach I want to take with my students? Um, is this going to support my population? Does it fit my philosophy, my needs? And, and in order to make sure you do that, you do have to listen um, to teachers, but it's unprecedented. We've been through a pandemic so much socially, politically in our country that that there are some shifts that were really warranted in the fourth edition. So we did make some changes and that's always a little fraught with risk, but um, we're getting some pretty amazing feedback from people who are using the fourth edition that they are having some of these changes deeply resonate with their students. And that's important. So when did you bring in, you have this impact model and I want you to talk about it a little bit, but what edition did you bring that in? Because it's actually, I'm now realizing that maybe I was talking about the third edition. When did you bring impact in? Impact just came out in the fall, really. Oh, that was that okay, was the great. big start of it for the fourth edition. So yeah, the the impact approach and, and obviously we're using a mnemonic to help students and faculty remember these six strategies uh, to support students' uh, skills for uh, uh, learning and being successful. So the impact strategies, like I said, um, are all based on what research suggests is going to help students learn to be better students. Yes, in introductory psychology, but also across all of their classes. So we based all of this on prior research in the field, lab research, translational research, not just one or two findings, but where you have replications, extensions, very bold, robust areas of research. So the six impact practices, uh, the heuristics are I for improving, which pertains to helping students develop a growth mindset. M for monitoring, which is really about self-regulation, in particular, self-regulated learning. Um, so in self-regulated learning, you want to be goal-directed, manage your time and strategies and check that you're on track to meeting your goals. Uh, the P is practicing, which is repeated practice, which goes back to Rodiger and Karpicki and so many people uh, who have done uh, research in that field. The A is Attending, obviously, which is critical for any time you want to have students learn things. They have to pay attention to it, which I don't know. You may recognize that as an issue with your students at times, Garth. Sure. We certainly do. Yeah. Um, the C is connecting, which is about using cues and retrieval cues um, to help students be able to remember and retrieve information. Um and the T is thinking deeply, which is all about elaboration, uh, not just focusing on the surface level of whatever you're reading or thinking about in class, but really trying uh, to go more deeply and understanding how things occur, why things occur. Um, and again, all of these strategies go back to prior research. As a matter of fact, a lot of them are summarized in Dunlosky's article, which I, I, I know you and, and um, others in the field have talked so much about as being sort of orienting and orienting review article. So those are the impact practices. And you're right, it is, um, these are embedded throughout the fourth edition. So um, we have these colorful infographics, one for each one, bright colors, sort of cartoonized, a little funny, um, that helps students understand how to break down these skills into actionable things. Um, and they are located in parts of the book that talk about that material. Uh, so, for example, um, in uh, the chapter on development, we talk about this idea of growth mindset improving, whether it's improving some aspect of your own life or improving working with somebody else, children or the elderly, we apply it there. So, 
it's nothing added. It's just a reframing of the content we already cover to give it a lens that really focuses it back on the students, something they can use that for themselves. And then the last piece of the connective tissue in the book is we have these learning pauses scattered throughout that are all coded back one to each impact practice with specific to do like, okay, you know, uh, in terms of the growth mindset, are you making sure that you're reminding yourself that, you know, making a mistake or failing is not the end? Are you making choices about a change you can make to do better next time and so on and so forth? So we have these little reminders spread throughout the book as well. So the architecture of the book now has this webby characteristic inside where all of these six impact strategies and their associated learning pauses are interconnected. Um, throughout the book. So the students don't just get one pass at them, they get multiple passes at them. So when you, when you assess this for your students, um, do you feel like they walk away from the intro psych course kind of understanding what impact is? Yeah. And, and uh, if so, I mean, congrats, because that is a huge win, I think, for students carrying that forward into other uh, other courses. So yeah, maybe yeah. just talk about that for a moment. It, you are, again, you, it's, it's like you have a little bit of a insight into my brain. So it, it's not enough to just create the structure in the book because teachers are going to be using the book with their students. So we have to create resources for teachers so that they can feel comfortable. So we have activities that they can use, um, whether it's online or in face-to-face, -face, brick and mortar. We have activities that they can use you know, surveys, um, reflections, all sorts of different things that they can use with their students for these impact strategies. And those are across all the chapters. But on the other end, we also have assessments. So whether it's in our um, online adaptive homework tool or whether it's in quiz questions that um, the teachers get that they can organize into quizzes or test bank questions, we have all these different small assessments that the students interact with. So we have, again, this three-part package, supporting the student learning, supporting the teachers, and getting the assessment data, all of which go together. So students can't not get exposed to these, um, and they can't miss having activities that they have to do about them. And because it's repeated, they get this over and over. Now, my class, my architecture means they're really, they're super captive because it's such a focus. So um, we do this most weeks in one way or another, some activity or survey or reflection or feedback or something. And then I, I, I get some uh, of the students' perspectives at midterm and at the final exam. And their feedback is really important. And what, what they say, the vast majority of them, 85% of them or so say that, um, it was either very helpful or extremely helpful to learn about these impact strategies. And when I ask them, well, which ones do you think you're going to use again, right? And multi-select, right? Every single one of them is important. There's none of them that's at like 20%. They're all over 50%. So students, you know, each individual student might only pick two or three, but across students, they all are, are resonating. Um and when my students do their uh, their reflections and they have a final essay, you know, it does come back and they say that this was important, not just in this class, but in their other classes. I actually had a student who took this class the second semester of their freshman year. And they said, if I had had this at the start of my first semester, my GPA would be much higher. Um, so we're getting this kind of feedback from students all the time. Um, the next step is we have to develop some direct assessments as well, looking at um, some learning outcomes in terms of um, their performance, um, developing this these skills. So we're in the process of, of that as well. And actually, I'm working uh, with Norton and my college to develop that. My, my college has um, recognized the value of these success skills, and we're starting to bring these success skills into other 101 level classes at my college and um, training other teachers to to help sort of um, bring FYE a little bit, bring student success, that course into as many of the intro courses as we can. So it's it's getting bigger over here at Parkland to use these skills for success. Well, you know, what I like about that is, of course, as psychologists, 
we kind of know this research of what helps students yeah. learn. Uh, and however you have been able to package this thing, um, you're communicating it outside of our discipline for the benefit of students who we may not see uh, in intro psych. And we see most of them. We see a lot of them, maybe not most, but we see a lot of them. But what yeah. about those other ones? I love that you're taking yeah. this, packaging it, and and that other people are going to use it. Um, it just helps us kind of take the value uh, of psychology uh, out to our colleagues. Um, what I'm also just remembering, I've been having conversations with people lately about is, um, you know, we also have to remember what can we learn from other people's disciplines as well. That's another conversation. But um, so... <laughs> Is there anything that, um, well, I, I think I have a final question and um, okay. I'll put you on the spot. I'm going to put you on the spot. And that is, if I was an instructor and I like the sound of this, I like that it's all baked in, that my students are going to get these kind of skills. It's, it's, it's like a web, like you describe throughout the content of the course. What, what does onboarding to this book look like? Because I think that would be yeah. one of my major concerns is uh, in, into kind of considering something new is like how much, I know yeah. it's going to be work, how much work? Yeah. So there you go. That's the question. You know, it's a really great question. And, and again, teachers are not one size fits all. You can't, I mean, I have spoken with teachers in California who are gigging at three colleges eight sections, three colleges, right? Um, and I know other faculty, their full load is a 3-3. Three, three. That's great. You know, different people have different lives, responsibilities. You can't assume one size fits all. So we don't organize anything so that it's required. So a teacher who is using psychology in their life for your class, you can use your own preps. You can use the, uh, the, we have created PowerPoints, of course, with information from the book, but also active learning. You can use what you've prepared, what we've prepared, a little bit of each. You can change what you want to do in terms of talking with your class or making videos if it's online or hybrid as much as you want. But the materials that are provided on our end by the publisher will run consistent with the textbook and you can augment it or not as you wish. So often what I say to teachers is, look, take a look at these impact practices. If you think this is philosophically important, if you want your students to not just learn content, but skills and skills that will help them throughout their college and professional uh, lives and, and in their personal lives too, which of these do you think is most important? Which resonates with you? Pick one. If you're going to change a class day or a week, where are you going to put your efforts? And okay, let's say for a lot of people, the foundation of the house um, is growth mindset. For a lot of other people, it's practicing. How can I get my students to practice with this over and over? Pick the thing that's important to you. And if you're going to change one week, then okay, maybe the next time you do it, consider changing a couple of weeks, make three touch points for that throughout the semester and build it up from there. And that that's exactly how I started. And the results were so astonishing. My students were hungry for this. They wanted more. And if you have that experience, then you will be motivated to find ways to pull in other pieces that are important to you to give those to your students. So I would say make it into small bites bite-sized chunks, align it with your goals, honestly, for the class, pick the success skills, the impact skills that are most important to start with, and then move on from there. But rest assured that the materials, the book, the teaching resources, and the assessment all function in a unified whole around these learning goals. And you don't have to worry about that being disrupted by what you are doing in your face-to-face -face or recording or online classes. Well, that is, uh, that's encouraging that it can be done little by yes. little because I think it's a daunting task. I'm kind of in an overhaul right now and take, it's, take it's daunting. I needed a year to do it. So <laughs> yeah, no, it's good. Um, well, Sarah, thank you so much for sharing a little bit about the philosophy of your book. The book is called Psychology in Your Life uh, and it's from W.W. Norton. And I want to just thank you for uh, taking the time today to share a little bit about it with us. Thank you so much. This was so nice of you to invite me, Garth. I appreciate it. It was lovely to chat with you. And I hope you have a really nice sabbatical.
Thank you. Yeah, I feel uh, great. Uh, equal parts grateful, and um, and then also a little shy about telling people about it. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm just gonna want to see what you do with your course when you come back. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. We'll have to have a podcast where we interview you and find um, out what you've done to make oh changes. Oh my gosh! Yeah, you have so well, much information uh, now from so many people. You know, and you know what the, in the end, it's uh, it, almost like what you said, which is, I think you've got to do the course that fits with who you are as an instructor yes. and uh, more is adding more is not necessarily good. In fact, I think no. in many ways it's bad. Um, so going in depth with student skills uh, as you've done, um, I think is a value that we're almost like as a community of psychology teachers, we're moving together. It seems like toward that end. And so, um, yeah, and now we're seeing it reflected in books, which is, which is lovely. So yeah. anyway, Sarah, thanks for joining us. Thank you so much, Garth. You take care. You take care as well. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.